Oh, hey there. It's education time. Sorry, I was getting a little psyched up with some Mastodon. Going to talk to you today about two very important early modern European philosophers, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. Now, this one goes out to at one Republican 79 who asked uh, on Twitter, Hello, I was wondering if I could request a video on Thomas Hobbes versus John Locke. My test is coming up at the end of this week. All right, so there you have it. So Hobbes and Locke, you've probably already heard about the divine right of kings. If you haven't, check out my video lecture on that. But you've likely been exposed to Jacques Bossuet, however you say that, uh, it's French, and he was a proponent of divine right absolutism. Now, this isn't going to be about Bossuet, okay? This is going to be about something different. Uh, both Hobbes and Locke reject the idea of divine right, and Hobbes is going to advocate for absolutism like Bossuet does, but it's going to be a philosophical absolutism, where John Locke is going to advocate for constitutional government, a limited government, and he is going to use both philosophical and biblical justifications for his argument for constitutionalism. So Hobbes and Locke are both going to give us two versions of a social contract. Now keep in mind that Rousseau wrote a book called The Social Contract, but he's not the first philosopher to address this subject. What the social contract essentially is, it covers two things. First of all, what is the origin of government? How did people decide to have government? And second, how much authority should the state have over the individual? And Hobbes and Locke are going to sort of agree on the first part, but they're going to disagree on the second part. Let's start off with Thomas Hobbes, who wrote a book called Leviathan in 1651. Remember that, Leviathan. Um, same as Mastodon's second album, which I'm kind of introducing you to little by little in this uh, lecture. And in Leviathan, Hobbes is defending philosophical absolutism, the idea that absolute government is not best because it's mandated by God, it's best because, well, because it's best. Let Hobbes explain to you why. Now, what is a Leviathan? A Leviathan is a sea monster mentioned several times in the Old Testament. And it's mentioned in detail, described in very much detail in the book of Job. Specifically in Job 41. Now, let me go ahead and read a little bit to you from Job 41 with a little bit of Mastodon theme music, uh, you don't mind. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook, or his tongue with a cord? Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? The answer to all those questions is unequivocally no. The Leviathan is not going to be caught with a hook, and he's not going to beg you for things, and he's not going to make requests. Wilt thou play with him as with a bird, or wilt thou bind him for thy maidens? No, don't try that. I wouldn't recommend it. Lay thine hand upon him. Remember the battle. Do no more. You may try to cross the Leviathan, but you will learn your lesson, and if you battle with that Leviathan one time, you will not do it again. Now, Hobbes is writing about this Leviathan because this is the sort of ruler that he would like to see, the sort of ruler that he thinks is necessary in order to keep us from destroying each other. Hobbes' view of the world before government was a state of nature, which Hobbes refers to specifically as a state of war, a war of all against all. Those of you who have trouble with the English language and would like to see it translated into Latin, here it is. Bellum, ominum, contra, omnis. A war of all against all. But if you could write this on your AP Euro FRQ or something like that, that would really make an impression. Bellum, ominum, contra, ominous. 
And Hobbes believed that before government, life in the state of nature, in the state of war, all against all, that life was solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Five things, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Richie, what's that pony doing up there? Well, this was my pony before a janitor erased it at the end of last year. Rest in peace, my pony. But this actually comes from an acronym that my students came up with. If it helps you, great. If it doesn't, whatever. Super ponies need back scratches. Super ponies. That's a super pony right there. So super ponies need back scratches. Solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So the idea here is that we need a ruler who is strong enough that he is beyond challenge, that people think I could not possibly mess with that guy because that is the only thing that keeps us from tearing each other apart. That this Leviathan, who is so large, you can see him looming large over everything, larger than the city, and you see that his garments, his chain mail is made of people, and he's so big as to be beyond challenge, and that will make us behave ourselves when we otherwise would not and it will keep us from destroying one another. And this comes down to Hobbes' view of human nature, which really isn't that far away from John Calvin's, who said that uh, man is totally depraved and incapable of really doing any good unless his heart is quickened by the Holy Spirit. And yes, that's kind of the inspiration for the Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. These two philosophers, one religious, one political, that tend to think like each other when it comes to human nature. They have a very pessimistic view of who we are. Uh, then again, we might say, oh, well, yeah, I, I trust people. I generally think that people are good, kind of in the vein of the Italian Renaissance humanist. But Hobbes asked, if you think so much of people and you trust your fellow man so much, why do you lock your door? And everybody says, ooh, yeah, think about it. How about give me your social security number? Just send me an email, tr at tomritchie.net. Tweet it to me. At Tom Ritchie, uh, you know, let the whole world see it. I mean, what do you have to fear by giving out your private information? Wait, what? You, you don't trust me? Good call. Because, really, if it weren't for the law and all of that stuff, I would be the first person to slit your throat and drink your blood for breakfast. Actually... I wouldn't drink your blood because that would make me a vampire. And if I were a vampire, I would not be able to drink this. But anyway, yeah, humans can be pretty cruel at times. Now, keep in mind that Hobbes is specifically writing against the backdrop of the English Civil War. Hobbes saw absolute government in England break down and lead to this long civil war at the end of which the king is beheaded. We see the end of civil government as we know it. And so Hobbes didn't really see any evidence that people can live together without some sort of absolute authority binding them down. So remember that Hobbes doesn't see this as God wills absolute government, but just that absolute government is the only way that we will survive without destroying each other. Okay, now let's talk for a bit about John Locke's philosophical constitutionalism. Constitutionalism, as we've already talked about in another lecture, is the limitation of government by law. And constitutionalism is what eventually won out in England, and John Locke was its biggest advocate. He outlined his constitutionalist philosophy in his 
Two Treatises of Government, published in 1689. Remember that title, Great FRQ Fodder. And he is writing in defense of constitutionalism. And in this, John Locke is talking about natural rights, which he believed that God gave to Adam in the book of Genesis. So keep in mind that Locke is using a biblical justification for his argument in addition to logic. And so he believed that God gave Adam natural rights and thus gave these natural rights to every human being. These natural rights are life, liberty and property. Now remember, pursuit of happiness, this is Jefferson trying to change the wording around a little bit so that he doesn't get uh, caught on turnitin.com or whatever. Uh, so he's only partially plagiarizing Locke. But these natural rights are given to human beings, but it's very difficult for us to defend them in the state of nature. I can say all I want that I've got a right to be alive, I've got a right to be free, I've got a right to the fruits of my labor, but in the state of nature, somebody can just come take that away from me. So people get involved in a social contract in order to preserve what they can of their life liberty and property. And it's the government's job to protect these natural rights. Uh, the whole point of government is so that we can enjoy these things to a greater extent than we would if we didn't have government. So this government can be limited by law. And furthermore, if this government is not preserving the lives, the liberties, the properties of their citizens, then the citizens have a right of revolution. They have a right to overthrow the government. This is why Jefferson is making so much use of Locke in the Declaration of Independence. This is all about Locke's philosophy, that when government has failed to protect natural rights, then the people can revert back to the state of nature. They may alter or abolish their government, as Jefferson says, so that they can recreate the government in a way way that will better protect the lives, liberties, and properties of the people. Now keep in mind that John Locke is writing against a different backdrop. While Thomas Hobbes was writing against the backdrop of the English Civil War, John Locke was writing against the backdrop of the glorious and almost bloodless revolution, comparatively bloodless as far as revolutions are concerned. But this was a revolution that didn't see a lot of fighting. The king uh, just uh, was kind of ousted. There's uh, William III, uh, William and Mary fame, and he's on his horse acting like he's about to go to battle, but sorry, William, there's no battle. Oh, what was that? Well, then, it's graphic organizer time. Uh, if you'd like, you can uh, download a copy of this graphic organizer from my website, www.tomrichie.net slash euro, or you can just follow along with us. We are going to compare and contrast Hobbes and Locke in a simple graphic organizer. Now, first of all, we're going to make some comparisons. Keep in mind that when AP asks us to compare, they're asking for similarities. So let's talk first about how Hobbes and Locke are similar. First of all, the original state of mankind was the state of nature or the state of war, as Hobbes would call it. And is government established by divine right or by social contract? It's established by a social contract. So in both of these, Hobbes and Locke are in agreement. Now, how governments are established, they agree. Well, what do we do from then? That is where they disagree. Now we're going to contrast. Keep in mind that when AP says to contrast, they want differences. So why government? Hobbes says that we have government because this is to protect us from ourselves, while Locke says that the purpose of government is to protect our natural rights of life, liberty, and property. They disagree on this point. As far as where sovereignty resides, where is the ultimate power? Do people give up their sovereignty when they institute a government? Does government rule over them or is government their agent? Hobbes says that people give up sovereignty for their own good to an absolute ruler and they cannot take it back. When they have created a government, they have crossed a Rubicon, so to speak. 
while Locke says that the people maintain sovereignty, that the people create a government to protect their natural rights, and if that government ceases to protect their natural rights in a way that's better than if they were in the state of nature, then they have a right to overthrow the government. So that's a point of disagreement. Can a government's power be limited? Hobbes says no. Locke says yes. So this makes Hobbes an absolutist and Locke a constitutionalist. When government is not doing what it's supposed to do, do we have a right to overthrow it? Hobbes, who says that sovereignty resides in the monarch, says that no, there is no revolutionary right. Whereas John Locke says that if there is a long train of abuses and usurpations, if government is not doing as good of a job protecting our natural rights as we could do ourselves, then yes, we do have a revolutionary right. Well, that about sums it up for Hobbes and Locke. If you like what you heard, want to hear more historical goodness, then please subscribe to my channel. I'll be posting more stuff soon for those of you preparing for the AP European History exam. Stay tuned for some recommended videos. Until next time.